professor here in anthropology at USU. And it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you today, our speaker for the Ecology Center seminar series. I'd like to introduce Tyler DeRosh. He has a dual appointment in the School of Sustainability and the School of Historical and Philosophical, the School of Historical, Philosophical and Religious Studies. And he is a global futures scholar in the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Lab at Arizona State University. He is the co-founder of Erasmus Journal for Philosophy and Economics, which sounds totally fascinating. And his upcoming book is called Sustainability Without Sacrifice, a Philosophical Analysis of Human Well-Being and Consumption. So without further ado, I give you all Tyler. All right, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Jacob. So this project is, uh, well, it started out as a failed funding application. <laughs> now it's uh, under consideration again. Um, well, I won't tell you where, I guess, in case one of you is a, a reviewer. But um, this is a, uh, what we're hoping is going to be a multi-year uh, project that, uh, <clears throat> that was initiated with uh, my co-authors here, Dan Steele and Kian Min Swoo. Um, both of those people, Dan Steele is still at UBC, uh, Keon used to be there. He's currently at the University of College Cork uh, in Ireland. <clears throat> so in his address uh, to the IPCC in 2018, <clears throat> the documentarian Sir David Attenborough warned, if we don't take action, the collapse of our civilization and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Climate scientists have also warned that climate change could cause the collapse of civilization. Kevin Anderson, referring to a projection of global mean temperature by 2100, given business as usual, writes, there's, there's a widespread view that a four degree future is incompatible with any reasonable characterization of an organized, equitable, and civilized global community. Now, similar warnings, <clears throat> they've been made in writings that aim at the general public, and it, they've inspired an international wave of climate activism, people like Greta Thunberg, for example. Uh, in our paper, uh, we let the term climate collapse refer to civilization collapse that's caused by anthropogenic climate change. In this paper, we suggest that taking the risk of climate collapse seriously, it should prompt a fundamental free, uh, reframing of climate ethics. So <clears throat> there's three kind of big questions that I wanna to cover today. First of which, what do we mean by civilization collapse? Second, should the risk of climate collapse be taken seriously? That'll probably be, you probably can predict how I might answer that question. And then what are the implications for climate ethics if climate collapse is actually uh, taken seriously, if it's actually a serious risk. So <clears throat> climate collapse is civilization collapse that's caused by anthropogenic climate change. Since we take the phrase anthrop anthropogenic climate change to be sufficiently clear for our purposes today, clarifying the concept of climate collapse is simply a matter of explaining what's meant by civilization collapse. There's a long history of social theorizing that links civilization to notions of moral and technological progress, and often with supposedly universal, universal stages of social complexity. However, we wish to avoid pre any presumptions that larger scale societies are somehow morally superior to smaller, less complex societies. Not only are such ideas unwarranted from a philosophical perspective, they have often been used to justify things like colonization, slavery, and forced assimilation of indigenous peoples. Consequently, we propose a concept of civilization that dispenses with this kind of unwanted baggage. A building collapses when it falls down and collapses the more figurative, in the more figurative sense relevant here is often thought of as a steep decline in some important quantity. For example, an economic collapse could be defined as a drop in gross domestic product of say 20% or more in a single year, or the collapse of a fishery might be understood as a drastic reduction in the population of a commercially important fish species. Such examples suggest that a concept of civilization collapse 
should be associated with some quantity that might undergo sharp drops as a result of various types of shocks. We suggest that social development, as elaborated by Morris in his 2013 book, The Measure of Civilization, can play this role. Morris defines uh, social development as the bundle of technological subsistence organizational and cultural accomplishments through which people feed, clothe, house, and reproduce themselves, explain the world around them, resolve disputes within their communities, and extend their power at the expense of other communities and defend themselves against others' attempts to extend. More succinctly, social development is a matter of the scale at which a society can use its bundle of accomplishments to get things done in the world. Morris proposes to measure social development as an index of energy capture per capita, social organization, information uh, technology, and war making capacity, and shows how that his particular index can be estimated from archaeological and historical data. Note that greater social development here, it need not correspond to greater goodness or justice, as can be appreciated by considering by examples as a, like in a large empire that is based on slave labor and say a small hunter-gatherer society. So social development in the way that we're thinking of it as, and also as defined by Morris is not conceptually linked to moral progress. Civilization collapse, we suggest entails a steep decline in a society's social development. Uh, and what we mean by this is in the material, organizational and cultural capacities that it relies on to perform functions like providing food, housing, and maintaining social order. In addition to decline, a notion of collapse typically also involves a threshold that indicates a loss of basic functionality. So a fishery collapse, it implies not merely that a fish stock has diminished, but that they have been reduced to a level that the fishery is no longer a basis for livelihoods. For the case of civilization collapse, we suggest that this threshold be understood as the capacity to enact a conception of what is just or good for a society. The term capacity here is key. It's not merely that the government has failed to maintain social order and can be replaced by a more competent leadership, for example. It is that the society lacks the organizational or mental or material basis that's needed to do so. So it's all about the capacity. We therefore take civilization collapse to mean that social development is reduced to a level where the society is no longer able to implement, even as an approximation, any scheme of distributive or procedural justice, even though we might disagree about which principle is the correct one. So our definition of collapse, it can be connected with uh, climate change scenarios that are discussed uh, in the philosophical literature. For example, in Climate Change and Future Justice, uh, McKinnon writes, the net result of a five degree increase would be a, a worldwide famine, severe conflict over water in the world's desertified regions and extreme territorial insecurity for those living in the dwindling inhabitable areas as an ar archipelago of refuges is put under increasing pressure by hungry and desperate people. McKinnon here, in her book, she suggests that these conditions of extreme resource scarcity would make the joint pursuit of justice impossible because self-preservation would overwhelm social norms and any ideas of sacrificing for a greater social good. Although McKinnon does not use the word collapse in connection with societies or civilizations, what she describes is naturally interpreted as a global climate collapse in the sense that we've defined. Mulgan's broken world, Mulgan is another philosopher. Mulgan's broken world, he paints a somewhat less bleak picture. The broken world faces major economic and environmental scarcity as a result of climate change. Large swaths of the planet have become uninhabitable and many societies that currently exist uh, have long since collapsed. On the brighter side, if there is one, modern large scale industrialized societies for Mulgan, they still exist. Mulgan imagines that these societies implement measures intended to ensure that population does not outstrip resources, namely survival lotteries. We back on? All right. 
so these survive, he has this idea of these survival lotteries, okay? Wherein the government, when they're confronted by food and water uh, shortages, culls the population according to a formula that's deemed fair. Sounds pretty frightening to me. <laughs> In Mulgan's broken world, uh, then climate collapse is widespread, but not quite global, as some large non-collapse societies remain. The third philosopher who's kind of considered these really devastating scenarios is uh, Wondish in 2019 in his article in the Journal of Applied Philosophy. Wondish discusses ethical obligations for wealthier nations created by territory loss due to climate change, which by reducing a nation's access to needed resources may undermine its capacity for political self-determination. According to Wondish, a people's continued political self-determination in practice usually relies upon strong institutions and infrastructure. These institutions are political, judicial, uh, and economic. In our terms, one dish is concerned with the risk of local climate collapses, and he argues these should be seen as moral wrongs in their own right, that wealthier nations consequently have an obligation, not merely to accommodate refugees, but also to relocate entire societies. Despite Wondish's focus on severely adverse climate impacts, his discussion is significantly more optimistic than McKinnon's and Mulgan's scenarios insofar as assuming that climate change does not threaten the capabilities of wealthier nations to compensate for climate loss and damage. Moreover, relocating entire nations could be a way of avoiding collapse. If the island nation of Kiribati, for instance, successful, successfully relocated to Fiji, um, where it has already purchased land actually, then it would not have collapsed because it would still be able to implement conceptions of distributive uh, and procedural justice among its population. So he clearly means something different than what we mean. Now, our brief overview of the philosophical literature related to climate collapse has turned up three different types of scenarios, collapse across the entire globe, severe declines in social development globally, along with widespread but not global collapse, that's Mulgan, and local collapses of certain vulnerable states combined with stability, the stability of wealthier, less vulnerable countries. And that's one dish's view. For convenience, we might refer to these as global collapse, the broken world and local collapse respectively. So what I now wanna do is consider reasons why climate collapse in these senses uh, should be taken seriously. This second part is in response to the second question that I had on uh, the earlier slide. So reasons to take climate collapse seriously. We provide some reasons for thinking that uh, the risk of climate collapse uh, should be taken seriously. But one thing that we're not doing here is predicting that climate collapse will occur. That's not our project. We're not saying that climate collapse is going to occur. We just think that it's a non-negligible possibility that it will occur and that it ought to be taken seriously. So nor do we even attempt to assign a probability that, to that outcome. Instead, we simply claim that, okay, I'm repeating myself. Uh, we simply claim that climate collapse is this non-negligible uh, possibility, this risk. So warnings that unchecked climate change may lead to civilization collapse, they often cite this plus four degrees uh, Celsius as this crucial threshold at which the risk becomes a serious possibility. A World Bank report in 2012 entitled Turn Down the Heat, Why a Four Degree Warmer World Must Be, must be Avoided. It characterizes a four degrees uh, Celsius world as one of unprecedented heat waves, severe drought, and major floods in many regions, with serious impacts on human systems, ecosystems, and associated services. It discusses the likelihood of compounding climate impacts and, and states that a four degree warming the risk of crossing critical social uh, system thresholds will grow, at which point institutions that would have supported adaptation actions would likely become much less effective or even collapse themselves. Bettis et al. in 2017, they discuss concepts of, of societal collapse, identify climate ruin with a four degree Celsius or greater increase in global mean temperatures from pre-industrial levels. And they argue that the world is currently running a risk of climate ruin in excess of the risk of financial ruin allowed for by insurance companies. Civilization destabilizing risks of a plus four degrees Celsius world include some densely populated regions becoming uninhabitable 
due to sea level rise or extreme heat and synchronous crop failures leading to global food shortages. In his book, in his book, Our Final Warning, Linus sums up the grim picture. With four degrees of heating, massive shocks to society will be taking place, threatening or even destroying modern industrial civilization because of mass starvation, flooding, and the loss of large areas of the tropics and subtropics to extreme heat and drought. There is then uh, some basis for thinking that risk of global climate collapse is a serious concern if global heating reaches four degrees Celsius, which permits a simple linkage between the climate collapse and the IPCC's assessment reports. The most recent, the sixth uh, assessment report, AR6, it considers five shared socioeconomic pathways, which can be divided into two high and one uh, intermediate and two low emission pathways In the two high emission SSPs, SSP3 to 7.0 and SSP5 to 8.5, CO2 emissions increase at a rate similar to that of the past decade for most of the 21st century. In each high emission SSP, plus four degrees Celsius falls within the very likely, i.e. 66% to 100% range for the years uh, from 2081 to 2100. Thus, a plus four degrees Celsius is taken as a proxy for risk of global collapse. Uh, if it's taken as a proxy, the AR6 tells us that this risk is a non-negligible possibility given the IPCC's high emissions uh, SSPs. High-end pathways and SSP5 to 8.5 particularly are often uh, taken to represent business as usual, that is, the future course of greenhouse gas emissions uh, this century if no effective mitigation efforts are taken. That is enough to suggest uh, that the risk of global collapse this century should be taken uh, seriously. To be clear, our aim here is not to predict and, and that our work is really motivated by the desire to avert climate uh, collapse. Moreover, we regard confident predictions that climate collapse will or will not happen as suspect given the massive uncertainties that are inherent in the situation and the unprecedented nature of these threats. We only claim that climate collapse should be counted among scenarios that are plausible given our current knowledge. In the next section, what we do is we explore the implications for this for climate ethics. We suggest that taking the risk of climate collapse seriously, it threatens two ubiquitous assumptions for climate ethics, which we call stable gov governments or SG and minimal, minimal current benefits or MCB. In this section, we propose to reframe climate ethics after rejecting these assumptions. Okay. So, the first assumption, stable governments, is the long-term persistence of governments that possessing the capacity to coordinate collective responses to climate change, such as implementing climate mitigation agreements, providing economic support for adaptation in lower income countries, compensating for loss and damage, and so on and so on. Without a high degree of social development, <clears throat> principles of, for distributive justice would be inert there would be an absence of government or other actors who could even facilitate these distributions. Thus, discussions of climate ethics that consider what principles of justice demand from wealthy countries over the long term often tacitly assume this assumption, stable, uh, stable governments. For example, consider the debates surrounding Posner and Weisbach's proposal that the only poli uh, politically realistic way forward on climate change is one in which nations more vulnerable to climate impacts compensate less climate vulnerable nations for the costs of reducing their emissions. While a number of philosophers have sharply criticized this proposal as unjust, as unjust, excuse me, these critics, they rarely challenge uh, its implicit assumption that climate change poses little threat to the long-term capacities 
and existence of these less vulnerable governments. Since the risk of climate collapse calls uh, stable governments into doubt, we claim that it should no longer be treated as an undefended uh, default in climate change ethics. Those who wish to make this assumption, we think they should be expected to justify its plausibility. Taking the risk of climate change seriously also calls into question the assumption that aggressive climate change mitigation would benefit future generations while providing little or no benefit to those who are presently alive today. We label this assumption the minimal current benefits. And according to the MCB, the long atmospheric half-life of CO2 and inertia in processes related to climate change, such as glacial melt and sea level rise, they make the benefits of emission reductions largely irrelevant to currently existing people. By the time the benefits of mitigation kick in, the reasoning goes, current generations will be dead and gone. Such ideas underline what the philosopher Stephen Gardner calls the pure intergenerational problem. Even if current generations suffer adverse effects of climate change, mitigation only affects future uh, generations, uh, only benefits future generations as well, so that each generation prefers to carry on with business as usual. As a result, pure intergenerate, as a result of the pure intergenerational problem, it is the rational uh, self-interest of each generation to simply pass the cost of climate change mitigation along to the next generation. Gardner proposes that this dynamic of intergenerational buck passing is crucial to explaining why effective action on climate change has been so difficult to achieve. We disagree with Stephen Gardner. Uh, we claim that there's good reason to reject this minimal current benefit assumption. A transition to renewable energy sources would yield significant benefits in the very near mid and long terms for those who are alive today. Some benefits would be immediate, such as reduced fine particulate, uh, uh, particulate air pollution. Recent estimates of worldwide premature morbidity, uh, premature mortality from fossil fuel generated particulate air uh, range from 3.6 to 8.7 million people annually. Thus, improved air quality resulting from a transition to renewable energy, it provides one powerful reason to question MCB. And other co-benefits of a transition away from fossil fuels exist, such as reduced environmental damage that's linked to fossil fuel extraction and transport and increased energy security. Indeed, some have argued that co-benefits alone suffice for a strong cost-benefit argument for transitioning away from fossil fuels today. But, Minimal current benefits is dubious, even if one limits attention to impacts on global heating. Consider the difference in expected global heating between high and low emission scenarios considered by the IPCC. By 2081 to 2100, the IPCC best, uh, best estimates for its two high emission scenarios are 4.4 degrees Celsius and plus 3.6 degrees Celsius, while the best estimates for its two low emission scenarios are 1.4 degrees Celsius and 1.8 degrees Celsius. The probability of exceeding or approaching the four degrees Celsius threshold by the last two decades of this century, therefore is much higher in the AR6's two high emission SSPs than in its low emission SSPs. So if the four degrees is taken as a rough proxy for risk of a broken world or global collapse, this means that aggressive climate change mitigation, it stands to significantly reduce these catastrophic risks for bi uh, billions of currently existing people. There are currently between, there are currently about 2 billion people between the ages of zero and 14. According to some estimates, two thirds of infants uh, born today may live to see the end of the 21st century. All right. <laughs> Uh, similarly, a significant portion of those currently aged less than 20 will clearly live to 2080. Furthermore, more recent modeling work suggests that climate change mitigation will reduce global warming more quickly than previously thought. Until fairly recently, conventional wisdom hel held that aggressive climate change mitigation would result in a short-term spike in warming due to the reduction of atmospheric aerosols 
Particulate air pollution resulting from burning fossil fuels has a cooling effect by reflecting sunlight. So it was thought that an abrupt decline in fossil fuel combusting uh, would lead to a brief pulse of, warm, of warming. However, Schindel and Smith in 2019, they explained that in this supposed pulse in, is mostly an artifact of an unrealistic modeling assumption, wherein GHG emissions were assumed to cease instantly rather than phase out over a period of decades. No such pulse actually occurs in models where emissions are phased out as imagined by the IPCC's low emissions scenarios. Instead, the effects of reduced CO2 concentrations and declines in the atmospheric aerosols cancel one another out for about the first 15 years after the start of the phase out while decreasing warming due to lower atmospheric CO2 concentrations uh, begins to dominate after that. So in short, uh, Schindel and Smith's conclusion, it suggests that many 50 and 60 year olds would live to see the tide turn on global warming if the world actually follows uh, low emission scenarios that are considered by the IPCC. And that we claim would be a significant benefit for those people. Business as usual puts current older people at risk of foreseeing that climate collapse will occur shortly after their own deaths. Indeed, older people in places that may be abandoned within several decades already confront a localized form of this foresight. The philosopher uh, Sam Scheffler, he argues that people without any social, cultural, or personal connection to the future after their own deaths would cease to find value in many aspects of life. Meaning in life and work is usually tied up with the sense of contributing to a larger human project that will carry on after you are gone. Why strive to build a better world, advance knowledge, or raise educated and morally grounded children if everything will come crashing down in a few short years after your death? Scheffler's argument, therefore, suggests that climate collapse, it would be devastating, not merely to those generations that endured it, but also to the preceding generation that could see it coming. Aggressive climate change mitigation, then, it benefits older people by reducing the risk that they will live through this terrible experience. Okay, on to uh, the different main frames in climate ethics and how we think that the frame ought to be radically changed given that we reject these two assumptions that are implicit uh, to climate ethics. The assumptions of stable governments and minimal current benefits, they're inherent in the traditional framing of climate ethics, which depicts current people and wealthy nations as having little to fear from climate change and considers their obligations to make sacrifices for future generations and the more vulnerable people. The traditional framing assumes uh, stable governments because it takes for granted that climate change poses no threat to the stability of wealthy Western nations. And minimal current benefits is reflected in the traditional framing's assumption that within these wealthy nations, climate change mitigation only benefits future generations, which we just argued is false. The traditional framing is widespread in climate change ethics. Shu's 2014 book, Climate Justice, Vulnerability and Protection, is just one good example. This book focuses on the injustice of the United States' position in climate change negotiations in the 1990s and the 2000s, and its discussion fits the traditional framing throughout. Shu argues that justice demands the, Un the United States should cut emissions because of its historical emissions and greater wealth. It is unfair, Shu argues, for the United States to refuse to act until poorer countries with less capacity to absorb the costs of emissions, uh, emission cuts and less historical responsibility for the problem to do so as well. It is difficult to argue with Shu's assessment of the unfairness of the United States' negotiating position on climate change during this period, but that's the past. Shu never discusses the possibility that the United States, due to its obstructionism, recklessly subjected its own citizens to risks of severe climate impacts. Throughout a chapter, one chapter on sovereignty that he has, Shu assumes that carrying on with business as usual is in the interest of the United States, but argues that sovereignty does not give states license to harm people outside their borders. The traditional framing does have the positive feature of highlighting inequalities related to climate change, as Shu's work illustrates, 
And this feature, it should be retained by any replacement. However, stable governments and minimal current benefits are no longer defensible, if they ever were. And in this context today, the traditional framing encourages misguided complacency among people in wealthier countries, like I'm safe from climate change up here in Canada, as well as inactivism, like mitigation won't do any good in my lifetime, so why bother? You know, these kinds of things. So let us consider alternatives to the traditional framing. If the traditional framing is not gonna work, what are some alternatives? Gardner's intergenerational bus buck passing is one option. This model, it assumes that climate change mitigation, it only benefits future generations. So each generation will, if self-interestedly rational, pass the buck of mitigation costs along to the next, ultimately risking doom to humanity. Intergenerational buck passing differs from the traditional framing in not assuming, not assuming stable governments since it suggests the gloomy conclusion that persistent failure to act on climate change may ultimately spell the end of civilization. However, intergenerational buck passing, it retains minimal current benefits. So it's called into question by the arguments that, we, that I just gave against uh, minimal current benefits. There's at least one well-known framing of climate ethics that's compatible with rejecting both uh, stable governments and minimal current benefits, namely the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons represents action on climate change mitigation as a kind of end person game, a prisoner's dilemma. Everyone's worse off if all cooperate than if all defect, but each individual is better off defecting no matter what the others do. This model can suppose that global collapse occurs in the absence of cooperation, hence a rejection of stable governments. And it can assume that mitigation benefits current generations, thus a rejection of minimal current benefits. So it seems like a good frame. However, the tragedy of the commons contains another questionable assumption, like stable governments and like minimal current benefits is apt to, pro to promote inactivism. The tragedy of the commons assumes that no individual, at least the original version of the, the uh, tragedy of the commons, it assumes that no individual can influence the behavior of any of the others. This is evident in the story commonly associated with a pr prisoner's dilemma. The prisoners, they're kept in separate cells. They're unable to communicate with one another and each decides without knowing what the other has chosen. The assumption that actors decide independently is also implicit in Hardin's classic formulation of the tragedy of the commons. Hardin imagines that herders who graze their sheep on a shared pasture that will be sufficient to feed all the animals so long as their total number uh, is kept below a certain threshold. Hardin assumes that the benefit from one extra sheep is captured entirely by its owner, while the harms of the common pasture are divided equally among the herders. Thus, Hardin concludes that the herders will, be will, if rational, add their herds until add to their herds until the commons are ruined. Most of us are probably familiar with the story. Note that in the tragedy of the commons, the cost of adding one sheep they're limited to the impacts that one animal on the pasture, and do not count any impacts on the choices of the other herders. This implies that each herder decides independently of the others. To see this point. Imagine that there's a social norm among the herders to refrain from overgrazing the common pasture. Then the failure of an influential herder to abide by this norm might encourage others to follow suit, thereby bringing self-ruin. Conversely, by making a point of carefully managing the number of sheep on, that they put on the commons, herders might encourage a norm of sustainable grazing to their own benefit. Hardin's tragedy of the commons assumes without justification that such social dynamics do not exist. The assumption of independent decision makers is highly implausible in connection with international negotiations and action on climate change. Efforts to create legally binding norms to promote climate mitigation have been ongoing since the Kyoto Protocol in 1992. The refusal of the United States to ratify this accord gave other countries like China and India a ready-made excuse to increase their own greenhouse gas emissions. Meanwhile, global greenhouse gas emissions have risen steadily since 1990, and climate change impacts such as floods, forest fires, 
and droughts now regularly strike the United States, United States and many other parts of the world. The assumption that self-interested rational agents may disregard the effects of their own behaviors on the choices of others inherent in Hardin's tragedy of the commons is therefore at least questionable with respect to the history of climate change negotiations. Nor is there any reason to suppose that this assumption is any more plausible now than it was in the past. Climate change mitigation, it requires a rapid transition to renewable energy sources, which exist and are becoming increasingly cost competitive with fossil fuels. Technology transitions are frequently, are frequently uh, frequency dependent, excuse me, population processes that gain momentum as more people adopt the new technology. And this general principle can also apply to a switchover to renewable energy. Positive tipping dynamics of these kinds are one of the few remaining hopes in the case for climate change mitigation. It is of course uncertain whether these dynamics will unfold quickly enough to avert climate collapse, but there's no reason to assume from the outset that they cannot. Moreover, such an assumption is morally abhorrent because it conceals an important motivation for aggressive mitigation while providing a rationale for inactivism. All right, so here's, here's our proposal for, for the new frame. Given the inadequacies of the, of the traditional framing, of the intergenerational buck passing and the tragedy of the commons, we suggest an alternative framing for climate ethics, what we call the sinking boat. Imagine that you are on a boat that's quickly taking on water and is in danger of sinking. There are buckets at hand to bail the water out and there are en enough people to do the job, but no single person can do it alone. Yet instead of bailing out water, everyone's arguing about who's most responsible and refuses to act until others go first. Some argue that those responsible for the leak should do the bailing, while others insist that the task should be split, split equally or that people should bail in proportion to their physical strength. Good swimmers, they're unconcerned as they stand a greater chance of being able to tread water until help arrives. Not sure by who, maybe the aliens. A few realists among them even propose that the poor swimmers should pay them to bail out the water. Still others fear that doom is unavoidable and calm themselves by imagining miraculous rescues while they try to ignore the water rapidly pooling around their ankles. What should you do? What should you do in this circumstance? Well, obviously you should immediately grab a bucket and bail as much water out as you can. You cannot prevent catastrophe on your own but you may be able to delay it and your efforts may encourage others to join in and ultimately save the boat and your life and everyone else is along with it. Success is not assured, but any other act seems potentially suicidal. The sinking boat suggests a model of social coordination wherein A, a non-negligible fatal risk, it exists for all individuals, although the risk is not equally probable for, for all. B, Action to mitigate the fatal risk is costly, but does not itself involve fatal risks. C, individuals can act to reduce the probability of the fatal outcome, but no individual can be assured of preventing it on their own. D, there is no authority that can compel everyone to mitigate the fatal risk. But E, each individual's mitigation actions may increase the probability that others will act as well. The sinking boat suggests that vigorously acting to mitigate a fatal risk can be dictated by self-interested rationality when conditions through E obtain. And by self-interested, we just mean looking out for your own well-being, your own welfare. Consider these uh, conditions in relation to international cooperation on climate change mitigation. In this case, the individuals are states whose representatives meet periodically at conferences, of the parties uh, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and who engage in debates resembling those of the people on the sinking boat. Abandoning uh, stable governments, it motivates the key condition, A, where the broken world or global collapse is the fatal outcome. Condition B is very plausible. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions will entail many short-term costs, including rebuilding existing infrastructure and refraining from generating revenue through continued fossil fuel exploitation. Yet despite these costs, 
transitioning to an, a non-fossil fuel-based economy does not plausibly risk any worldwide ca catastrophe on the scale of the broken world or global collapse. To the contrary, it comes with significant co-benefits, such as reducing air pollution and other environmental and public health risks that are linked to fossil fuels. Condition C, it's satisfied because successful climate change mitigation requires efforts by more than one state. Condition D is a basic circumstance underlying the failure of international climate change negotiations for the past 30 years. And finally, there are several reasons to think E is plausible in regards to climate change mitigation. Transitioning to renewable sources of energy will involve technological and behavioral innovations that other countries can copy. Once one country does it, it's easier for others to follow. The new technologies and behaviors may become norms that countries and their citizens desire to follow to ma maintain status or a positive reputation in the eyes of their peers. Moreover, countries that mitigate climate change could impose taxes on imported goods from countries that do not. In other, uh, in other words, aggressive climate mitigation measures by a relatively small number of influential countries, it could actually create a self-reinforcing social tipping dynamic. The sinking boat has several advantages over the traditional framing, uh, intergenerational buck passing and the tragedy of the commons. It avoids the dubious assumptions that underlie these framings and as a result does not foster complacency or inactivism. The sinking boat does not assume stable governments or minimal current benefits, and it does not assume away the possibility of positive social tipping dynamics. The traditional framing, intergenerational buck passing, and the tragedy of the commons focus climate ethics on the problem of explaining why justice requires states and individuals to act on climate change when doing so is against their self-interest. By contrast, the sinking boat suggests that for the bulk of humanity, self-interest and justice um, they tend to point in the same direction when it comes to climate change. Despite differing vulnerabilities to climate impacts and unequal distribution of fossil fuel profits, climate collapse is a threat to humanity as a whole, and mitigation consequently benefits everyone, almost everyone. In the sinking boat, people who can't swim are at a greater risk and more immediate risk than the strong swimmers, despite the fact that drowning is a serious risk for everyone. If the boat sinks, the good swimmers might be saved if rescue comes quickly enough or drown if it does not. So everyone is better off if the boat stays afloat, inequalities notwithstanding. Similarly, we are all on the same planet and hence at a risk of global collapse. Yet some are at greater risk of localized collapse than others. And it is possible that localized collapses could occur but not be followed by global collapse or the broken world. Nevertheless, the benefits of climate mitigation are not limited to the especially vulnerable or future generations. The sinking boat then, it pivots climate ethics towards considering mitigation as a matter of self-interest or prudence while not losing sight of inequalities. This prudential turn, we suggest, it provides a simpler motivation for climate change mitigation. Recognizing the plausibility of large temperature increases and the associated risk of civilization collapse, it puts pressure on two assumptions made in climate ethics. The first is that there will be the stable governments capable in, of enforcing and coordinating just procedures and distribution. And the second is that current generations, not only future generations, do not benefit from climate mitigation. Understanding that this could occur means that we should ref reframe climate ethics, for instance, by exploring different conflicts and sources of coordination, such as the framing that I provided today. Thank you. All right, do we have any uh, questions for Tyler? If you do, I'll run the 